for having me. It's fun to be here. A very packed room. How was uh, What's that? How was traffic? Uh, well, we had we had a we had a little trouble with another sharing economy company uh, on the way over here tonight. I'm not going to name any names, but anyway, I apologize that we're late. Uh, thanks thanks for hanging in there and waiting for me. I'm really excited to be here and talk with all of you. Thanks so much. All right, sit sit by the fire. It's pretty warm. It is pretty warm. Cool. Thanks, Mike, for coming. Um, so we can get started by first question will be I'm sure a lot of us here are curious. So could you share with us a little bit on your engineering journey, your career journey, and also how, how you joined uh, Airbnb? Sure. How how far back do you want me to go? Um, as far all the way. Right? All the way to the beginning, like the, the early days. days. Early days. My youth. Well, all right. I'll share I'll I'll share like an abri a bridge story because my uh, you know my path in engineering is maybe a little bit. Uh, different than, than most. Um, I was very fortunate along the way in my career, but um, the way that I got into engineering was pretty not standard. So I was in high school, um, I guess my junior year of high school uh, in Virginia on the east coast of the United States, and uh, I was working in a coffee place making lattes, you know, like as coffee people do. <laughs> um, I could make a pretty good latte back then. Anyway, and uh, I got to know some of the customers really well that came into this place, into this coffee shop. And uh, uh, one of them, this guy, Jason, uh, had a little tech company across the street that he was working on. So anyway, my senior year of high school rolls around. It turns out that there's an internship program with my high school. And so if I get an internship, I can go to school in the morning. And then in the, eve or in the afternoon, I can go to work. Instead of going to school, I get paid for it. And I was like, that sounds pretty good. Um, so I started talking to Jason and I'm like, hey, uh, what, what about you give me an internship at this company across the street? And he's like, no way. You don't know anything about computers. Why would I do that? Um, and so I was like, oh, that's a bummer. And then, and then I kept after him and I kept after him and I kept after him. And finally, I got him to agree to give me the internship. And the way I got him to agree is I said, if you hire me, I'll do computer programming stuff and learn that, but I'll also be the receptionist. I'll answer the office phone for you. And so he wouldn't have to hire a receptionist and pay for that. So I got the internship, so I'd answer the phone and I'd learn a bit about computers. I got really lucky at that uh, place that I worked. I worked alongside a bunch of really great computer programmers and I was able to pick up programming from them, take on bigger and bigger tasks over time. Then before you know it, that company turned into a startup company we were called I Atlas, I know, it's strange. And then that company, I Atlas, uh, got in 1999, we got acquired by the like hottest technology company in the world. And it was an acquisition, we got acquired, you might have heard of them, they were called Alta Vista. <laughs> yeah. So company got acquired, I moved to California, I was like 21 years old, barely. I had a job at Alta Vista and uh, sort of picked up my programming career from there. Alta Vista sort of, you know, had a difficult fate when Google came along. Um, then later I went to Yahoo, I went to Facebook after that. And so I just covered a lot of years in like a few words there. Um, then I was, at, I was at Facebook, I was leading the growth engineering team there um, and having a great time. I had some amazing experiences at Facebook. I was there the day that we crossed a billion monthly active users which was like an incredible thing. I was there on IPO day, which was like six o'clock in the morning when the market opens in helicopters over. I mean, it was crazy, right? Like really fun. Facebook was fun. But then I got introduced to this guy named Nate Blacharzik, who was one of the co-founders of Airbnb. And I'm like, well, I've got to talk to him, right? Because I've been paying attention to Airbnb. It's a really exciting company. And I went and had a coffee with Nate and had a conversation with him about the impact that Airbnb was having out there in the world and how it was touching people's lives really directly and their need for a technology leader. Um, because at, the, at that time, there were 40 engineers working at Airbnb and they all reported directly to Nate. So Nate was managing like 40 people. And so I got excited, then I started talking to Brian and Joe and I realized that like, this was the opportunity that I had been waiting for. And so, um, so I left Facebook, I went to Airbnb and that was a little bit over three years ago now. Ooh, nice. 
So a lot of us here are engineers, designers, uh, entrepreneurs ourselves. Great. Um, so we're curious, like, could you share a little bit more about some interesting projects that you have done um, at your time and at Yahoo, Facebook, Airbnb? Sure. Um, let's see, what's interesting work that I've worked on? What are you most interested in hearing about? Facebook, Yahoo, Airbnb, what do you want to hear about the most? Yeah, Facebook. <laughs> Facebook? <laughs> I have one Facebook, one Yahoo. Uh, let's see. Facebook was really interesting um, because it was like, Facebook was like an education in how to use data to make decisions. And an education in how to use data to make decisions and then how to do attribution of the work that you do to driving business results. Like Facebook's growth team is probably like the best team in the world at doing exactly that. How do we make sure that every hour that we spend working on engineering is like directly attributable to the business impact that we're actually driving with that work? And Facebook is like this incredible education in that for me. Um, a lot of which I'd like to think that I've helped bring to Airbnb. Um, what are interesting pro projects? Uh, what is the number one growth driver for Facebook? Can anybody tell me? Seven friends in seven days. Seven friends in seven days. Friending. Yes. <laughs> seven friends in seven days is like, is like the, uh, the indicator. So the more friends that you get in your first week or two, the higher likelihood probability that you'll be a monthly active user. So probably one of the most interesting projects uh, that we did at Facebook and you know this predates me quite a bit, but we worked on iterating on it and everything is that feature called People You May Know. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. So who wants to tell me how people you may know is ranked? Like, how do we decide which people to show you as a friend request? Nobody? Mutual friends. Mutual friends. All right, that is what it was. It was mutual friends for a long time because the way that we ranked people you may know was what do you think are the most likely people that you're going to connect with and friend, right? Like that was the ones we wanted to show you the first because then you generate the most friend connections and everybody it's like super, right? But one of the things that we learned is that it's more impactful to rank people you may know based on not who you're most likely to friend, but based on who needs a friend request from you the most to be engaged on Airbnb. Or sorry, on, on Facebook. <laughs> Well. But who needs a friend request from you the most to be engaged on Facebook? And so we would take like the people that like had some intersection with you, the ones who needed more friends to become more engaged on Facebook, and then we would surface those in people you may know. So you click on them, you get them engaged and bring them back. And that was a pretty cool project that we worked on uh, for Facebook growth. So you find the Facebook slackers. Yeah, you basically find the people who are like, they're only coming, you know, coming to Facebook four out of seven days. That's not enough. They need a friend request from you to bring them back all the time. So, that, I don't know, that was a pretty cool project at Facebook. And just like the, the depth of the science that goes into that, that problem space is, uh, is really pretty profound, uh, what they work on there. Um, I think at Airbnb, it's been kind of like, it's just so different when you're leading like an entire organization from when you're leading a part of it. You know, and so much of the project work that I think about that's interesting at Airbnb is like building how we do all of our recruiting and hiring, like how we think about talent and performance management, how we think about like incentives for engineers and how we get engineers to feel agency and ownership over their work. Like so much of, the, of everything that we do on the technology side like comes out of how we manage people. So I think about that when I think about my main project work at Airbnb. And I'm happy to talk about any of that, by the way, if it's helpful for folks in the room. So speaking about growth, there's a lot of talk about growth hacking and stuff. Right. So how do you kind of, what's your approach to growth at Airbnb? Yeah, I think that we really look at um, kind of a couple main areas right now. So we have one team, well, all right, let me back up a little bit. Why do people, why does Airbnb grow at all? Like why are people interested in using Airbnb? Um, they're interested in using it because the number, one, the number one reason people say is because they want to experience a better or more authentic type of travel. They actually want to connect with the destination that they go to. So the number one growth driver for Airbnb is providing a like, more authentic travel experience through our hosts that people love and so they come back and use Airbnb again and again. Like, that is actually, like I'll talk about a whole bunch of technical stuff that we do in funnel analysis and data and everything, but the reality is it's like the quality of the experience at the other end, the offline experience you have on Airbnb is what ultimately leads to our growth. And we see that the majority of our first time users, like the first time usage that we got on Airbnb comes from word of mouth. It's like organic growth, which is exactly how you want it to be. 
like you should actually keep track of that in you know whatever startups you're working on if you're consumer focused like especially if you're early stage you really want word of mouth to be a huge driver of, of your business because that means that people are out there saying good things about you right and so one of the things that I think the founders did really were really smart about early is that they found the earliest users of Airbnb, the early adopters, the first hosts out there, even the first guests out there, and they went and talked to them and learned about like, what do you love about this? What can we make better? They really understood the earliest users of Airbnb and how that informed their decision makings. And I think that that led to a lot of the quality and the growth that ultimately they saw down the line. So that is like the high level, like you have to have a great experience if you're gonna have good growth. Then when you have a great experience and you're getting uh, some growth out of that good experience, then you can start to optimize it, right? And you can start optimizing it, get better growth curves, like sort of, you know, channel the energy in the right way to get, to get your growth rates going the right way. And for us, there's probably two major optimization tracks that we work on. So one is around conversion. So how do we take people who are already coming to Airbnb, are already searching, are already viewing, uh, uh, you know, listing pages and get them uh, incentivized and encouraged to book. And so some of the most impactful things that we've done on that is increasing the number of listings that are instant bookable. Turns out it's much easier to instant book an Airbnb listing than go back and forth. Uh, we've done a huge project around uh, pricing. So price sensitivity is really important in the marketplace and hosts don't necessarily know how to price so we've done better pricing. Uh, and then something that we call um, urgency which is basically giving information to potential travelers about how many listings are available left for this date and how many people are looking at this listing. So you understand that like, it's a little bit fleeting, like you might wanna hurry up and book that listing if you really want it. Those things are incredible for conversion. Like they help get people through the funnel. We've got all of that um, instrumented and tuned so that anytime we tweak anything on Airbnb, we can tell how it affects those conversion metrics. So that's like one big category of growth and then then there's like a second part. So even if you have a perfectly converting product, right? Like let's say you've got 100% conversion, everybody uses it converts. That's fine unless you, get, so you start getting less visitors over time, okay. right? Because if you have less visitors over time, even if you're converting perfectly, your growth is gonna start slowing down, right? right? Unless you've got people coming to the top of the funnel. So the second major area that we think about for growth is how do we drive visitors to Airbnb? So that can be through um, brand marketing campaigns through more sophisticated targeting, uh, pay growth marketing, virality, engagement emails, all of that kind of stuff. And then when they land on Airbnb, how do we onboard that new user to get them ready to search and book? So that's like the other big category of growth work that we do. So retention is key as well in, in terms of growth. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's, we're very fortunate, like, um, you know, engagement, which was, you know, at Facebook was something that we talked about is like, how do you keep bringing people back and like giving them reasons to come back? Um, we're very fortunate that at Airbnb, our natural retention rate is incredibly high. So like, once we get you to try Airbnb for the first time, you're very likely to come back and try it again. So we do some work around engagement, but a lot of our effort is actually focused on getting people to try it for the first time because the retention rate is so strong already. So we're, we're pretty fortunate that way. So a lot of us here look up to Airbnb and of course yourself as well uh, throughout your career um, to where you are today. So are there any mistakes that you make throughout your career and what do you do in those situations? Ooh. Like what kind of mistake? Like, like uh, engineering mistakes or... or uh, uh, <laughs> well, I, I'll, tell, like, I'll tell one funny story and then maybe something like, like around like... Yeah, like I'll, I'll tell you one funny story from Alta Vista. Uh, when I was really young, I uh, one of the projects I was tasked with when I when I worked at Alta Vista was to create an internal search. So like you could basically search altavista.com for whatever you wanted to find, right? Do you, do you remember what, how this thing worked? It like had like a no, nobody remembers. Like if you go to like the the Wayback Machine, like you can find it, but. Um, basically, it was like to index all of the pages that were internal to altavista.com so that users could come in and search within the site. And so, I, you know, I'm building a search thing, right? Like, uh, what do you do? You build a crawler to crawl all the pages, right? And then stuff them into a text index so that, an uh, inverted text index so that you can search against them and they go match to the URL, right? And so I built this like really fancy crawler in, uh, in Perl. Yeah. 
<laughs> old school. And what it would do, it ran on my laptop. Oh man, God, this is a long time ago. Anyway, uh, and it would fork like a hundred workers that would go out and just hammer Alta Vista, like scraping all these pages, like pulling out all the indexable content and then stuffing it into an index. And so this thing is working well. Like I'm indexing the site, I'm like, cool, I've got this thing running, I can probably turn through it in, like, you know, in the next couple days. And so I plug my laptop into the ethernet at work and I leave it on my desk and I go home for the day. Meanwhile, it's like crawling Alta Vista. So the, the problem was that all of the pages that I was crawling were actually dynamically generated and were hitting a database behind the scenes. And so my laptop's sitting there churning away, just like pounding on Alta Vista. And then somewhere around maybe like 1 a.m., pagers start going off and like operation starts getting called and before you know it all of Alta Vista is down and then it was down it was down for eight hours <laughs> because of my because my crawler was running and hitting it and uh, and the reason so I basically did a denial of service attack yeah. on Alta Vista <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes it turned, and well exactly right why didn't any of the denial of service filters catch it because it was coming from an internal IP yeah. on my desk so I come into work the next morning I roll in and I'm like oh man I wonder how my crawler did and like the VP of engineering was like standing at my desk <laughs> like, like, good morning I'm like this. yes uh, anyway somehow I didn't get fired I don't know how that was a pretty big mistake uh, <laughs> I made along the way <laughs> um, I don't know, I can, I can talk about some other stuff, but that, that was uh, just a more of a fun story. So having done Pro, what is now your favorite programming language? Actually, um, actually, hold on, can I, can I tell one other thing just on a mistake? Because I sort of, t I told a fun story, but I think there should also be something like a little bit, a little bit deeper to share there. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I really value the time that I spent at Yahoo. I spent, I was there for seven years. And the entire time I was at Yahoo, uh, I felt like I was just being very successful. You know, like I, I was probably, you know, an individual contributor engineer for probably, you know, three of those years. And I was working on like mostly infrastructure engineering. I thought it was super cool. I, and like the work was really rewarding. And then I got into management and I started managing small teams and then mid sized teams and then bigger teams and bigger teams. And I felt very successful internally at Yahoo, you know. But you know, over that seven year period from 2004 ish to 2010, like, like while I was going the right direction inside Yahoo, right? Like my career trajectory was very good inside Yahoo. Yahoo itself was kind of going like this. And, and I guess like that sort of like the realization after the fact is that, you know, whatever you're doing, you should make sure that, you know, the company that you're working for is working as hard for you as you are for it. You know what I mean? Like you want to be on a company that's like on the right trajectory. And I think in hindsight, like career, when I left Yahoo, um, I was a VP of engineering. I was managing about 200 engineers at the time for Yahoo Mail and Messenger. And when I went to join Facebook, first of all, they made me go through 16 interviews to get the job at Facebook over about three months. Seriously, they weren't, they weren't sure because they hadn't hired anybody like that from, from Yahoo before. And when I joined, uh, Facebook, I was a VP of engineering at Yahoo, I joined Facebook as an engineering manager. They wouldn't even give me a director title. And I realized like how much the job that I had felt so strong and passionate about hadn't really been working as hard for me as I needed it to in that time. And I think that that was kind of a mistake. So just something to like keep in mind that, you know, always make sure that what you're doing is working really hard for you. Right. Cool. Thanks. Wait, what was yeah. the other question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was mm. um, so we were just asking about what, what, what is your favorite programming language mm. after you're done. So do you, do you still language. code on a day-to-day -day basis? I, de right I definitely don't still code on a, on a daily basis. Um, the last, well, let's see, I guess I've, I've got like sort of three projects in recent memory. Uh, one was between Yahoo and Facebook. I was also tinkering around with the idea of starting a company myself. And that was around the time that Node.js was just starting to pick up steam. And I got really excited <coughs> about Node. And so I spent, I spent a whole bunch of time writing, um, you know, basically like a, a real-time messaging system, not designed for chat, but for something else using Node.js when Node.js was still like kind of early. It's matured a lot since then, but that made me, you know, learn a lot more about JavaScript. And you know, a lot of people hate JavaScript, but I thought it was pretty cool. I liked it. Um, then I guess 
jumping forward to most recently, this was actually just a few weeks ago, I, uh, I started tinkering around with uh, something called React Native. <coughs> yeah? Friends, Who knows? Yeah. I see at least one Facebook t-shirt in here. Um, React Native is, is like, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's just like such a promising, interesting technology. Like, it, it could open the doors for a lot of people to be able to develop on native mobile apps that didn't have that opportunity to do it before. It has this idea or like this concept of being able to refresh an app on the server side without having to go through a whole app store uh, deploy and, and release. And so, and like with basic JavaScript skills, right? JavaScript and like and like web skills, you can actually develop code that's gonna that's gonna run native uh, on the on the mobile device. How cool is that? It's cool. So I got like really excited about it. So I got my Xcode all set up, and I got React Native set up, and I've been sort of tinkering around on an app. So that's that's maybe the other one I'm I'm excited about. Cool. Yeah. How many people in here have tried building something with React Native? Two. All right. Three. All right. Everybody else should check it out. It's cool. <laughs> So we wanted to open up the uh, the questions to the floor, uh, but maybe just one one more question. So, so a lot of things that we're, we're trying to do here at Carousel is also um, trying to build a very strong engineering core, engineering culture here. Yep. Getting so, what what's your kind of take on uh, what is a strong engineering culture to you, and how do you keep engineers engaged and happy? And, and well, I mean, I think that like, I think that like, engineer like the. The perception of like what is a great engineer has changed so much, even in the last ten years. Like I think that there was, there was a time where maybe not the last ten years, the last 10, 20 years, there was a time where it was kind of considered like you know you'll have a bunch of business people come up with a bunch of requirements and like you know what do they call them like a marketing requirements document or whatever like all that crazy stuff, and then like you come up with like these really like great requirements. And then you'd have designers design something, and then you'd hand it to engineers and say, "Engineer, write the code to do exactly that thing." Right? And you know, that's not really what great engineers do anymore. What great engineers do now is that they're part of a team that is like ideating, like from the very beginning, of like given a problem statement. Here's our problem statement. How we're going to work backward from the problem statement to a bunch of tactics that we can do that are actually going to get us to our goal. And the great engineers now, the ones who really want to you know, be involved in, in technology companies are the ones who have a voice in that strategic conversation about what are we going to work on and why, and what problem statements are we solving for. And so I think that, you know, one of the things that we try to do at Airbnb is make it so that every engineer has agency over what they work on. They have some say over what they work on, and they're part of that, uh, of that process of figuring out basically how to have impact towards the company's goals. And so if you say, to any engineer, like, you know, the thing that you're ultimately going to be evaluated on here, you know, at this job, is how much impact did you have towards the company's goals. But how you achieve that impact and how you move those goals is really up to you. You need to find that out. You need, you know, you've got managers to help you, you've got peers to help you, whatever. But ultimately, it's up to you to find the impact. Then suddenly, you're not just somebody who writes code. Suddenly, you're like a business owner. And you're working on it. And that is like the exciting stuff. Like that's where the creativity in the field comes from. And when you're writing that code on the screen, you want to know why you're writing it. It's yeah. not just because it was handed to you. It's because you know how this is going to actually drive the business that you feel passionately about. And so a lot of what we do and how we think about management of engineers and everything comes down to that fact. Like you have to have engineers have a lot of say over what they do. And I can talk about the mechanics of that at length, but that's the overall uh, philosophy and principle. Cool. Thanks. So we want to open up for the floor to ask questions. Uh, so we will we'll start taking questions from the floor. Um, anyone has any um, burning questions they want to ask? Yeah. Burning question. Not so burning, but yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, from a higher level perspective, what's the difference between a vice president of engineering and a CTO? Mm. And what's the overlap between both? Jeez, man, I haven't even really thought about that. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, titles are just such a strange business, anyway. I, you know, I guess you know, my job, my job is as VP of engineering is to you know manage the engineering team and make sure that the engineers have what they need to be successful, and that they are managed in a way that allows them to be business owners and be. You know, involved strategically the way I just talked about. Like that's a lot of, it's like the mechanics of that. Like actually driving, running that team. I think a CTO role, 
um, you know, is, it means something different in almost every company. You know, it's in some cases, the CTO is the person who manages all of the engineers. In some cases, the CTO is an individual contributor who takes on like big projects that are you know strategically important to the company. And I think both of those can work. At the end, it's just kind of like a title game. <laughs> but I think that you know, VP of engineering typically means you're the person who's sort of like hands-on managing all of the engineering team. And the CTO, in, in a lot of cases, has a little bit more space and freedom to take on like longer-term. Uh, uh, View projects, and they can do that either in a management role or in, in, a, in an IC role. So you guys have like a CTO in Airbnb. Yeah, Nate, Nate Lutrasek, he's a co-founder and CTO of Airbnb. He was the first engineer um, who, who worked at Airbnb, and Nate does kind of what I'm describing. Like he will take on uh, big projects about like how do we run the company. Then they might not even be technical projects. They might be like how do we set goals? Like how do we think about that? And Nate has an incredible mind for being able to go and set up processes like that that the entire company can follow. And that's actually like a great use of time for a, for a strong CTO like me. Yeah, good question though. It's made me think about it. <laughs> what, what are some things that can make or break kind of like a, a marketplace type of a business like you guys? Um, well, I mean, what makes a marketplace business is getting to like the critical mass of supply and demand where you have enough balance. I mean, if you, uh, if you look at Airbnb's history, right, it's like eight years, about, keep me honest, it's about, about that long. And you look at the growth curve on Airbnb, you see that for the first three or so years of Airbnb's existence, basically nothing happened. Right. And that was because there wasn't enough supply uh, in the marketplace to drive the demand, but there wasn't enough demand to drive the supply. So in the early days of a marketplace business, you have to be like on the ground like really, really tightly managing the community and like getting it off the ground, generating enough supply and demand until the flywheel effect starts to kick in and then you get that, right. that nice exponential growth curve. Um, I think that, so one aspect of it is like the balance of supply and demand. The other is um, it's just the quality of the service. Like it's sort of like I was saying, like I think bringing a, a marketplace off the ground means that you have to have, um, you know, high quality experiences, enough, balance of supply and demand to be able to drive both sides of the marketplace. And maybe a little bit more distinct to our marketplace than any other one is a sense of trust. Right. So like the other thing that makes or breaks the marketplace in our case is, um, is trust. You have to be incredibly confident that if you're going to you know, get matched to somebody online for a travel experience and you're going to show up in another country at somebody's house. That they're, you know, that they're somebody you can trust, right? And so when I think about like the fundamental building block behind Airbnb's success, it's things like, you know, the reputation system, like the review system. It's incredibly powerful to say that this person has been here and traveled here before and gotten positive reviews, or this host has a whole bunch of positive reviews because that builds this baseline of trust that then you can you can build on and get a successful business. Um, you know, things that'll break down a marketplace. I think it's just generally like if there's too much friction. We've invested a huge amount, uh, for example, in the payment system. A lot of people don't think about Airbnb as a payments company, but I mean, we're going to move a lot, a lot of billions of dollars through our payment system this year. I mean, it's actually completely massive. But why do we even have that? Because you don't want anybody to have to even worry about it. Like you might be paying in with a credit card, and the you know the host might be getting paid out in Western Union. You know, and going and picking up cash at a Western Union location, that should all feel completely seamless and transparent to you. So I think like having very low friction is is really important for a successful marketplace as well. Right. Yeah. There's a few thoughts. Did, did you develop your own payment system, or did you piggyback it on somebody else? Or all of um, all of our payments flow through us. We have our own payment system, but we work with a whole bunch of third-party vendors for things like credit card processing right. and you know, pans and payouts and banks and, and everything like that. But yeah, our, our payment system at the core, the thing that stitches all of that together is our own technology. Hey. I'm actually using Airbnb for the first time like this month. Oh, good. How's it going? It's going good so far. All right, good, good. So you said you depend a lot, like one aspect of like building that trust is the review and the verification system. So how do you incentivize like users who have used like Airbnb to actually give back and provide like reviews and like, um, and like uh, yeah, reviews for the like um, vendors like, what you call, like Oh, how do we, so how do how we? How do you incentivize the users to like why do you go back and 
views. Oh, how do we incentivize them to do it? Yeah. Um, well, it's kind of an interesting thing because because Airbnb is a very like human interaction. You know, you actually like go and meet your host and look them in the eye. Yeah. Um, people feel very sort of like compelled to leave a review because of that personal interaction. It's sort of different from like buying something from a seller on, on eBay where you know they might ask you to leave a review and you feel like, okay, fine, you know, I'll do it. It's like you actually met somebody and you stayed in their home, right? Like um, that I think has always led us to have an incredibly strong review rate. I think like more than 80% of, of trips on Airbnb are reviewed. Um, but uh, we did another cool thing uh, last year that, that helped as well, which is we wanted to get, or we wanted reviews to be more uh, honest. Yeah. Because the other thing about like you, you met somebody, you looked them in the eye and you stayed okay. with them, is that you're not gonna feel very good about saying like, well, I didn't actually have a great time. Or like, <laughs> you know, or like, you know, they didn't leave me a towel or something. You know what I mean? Like you don't feel good about that. Um, and you especially don't feel good because you know that if you click the submit button first on the review, they might read it and then they might leave a bad review for you, like as retribution, right? right. So, uh, yeah, so that light bulb went off in our heads, um, you know, I guess like a year and a half ago or something. And so one of the things that we launched is um, now reviews have a simultaneous reveal. So as a guest, you'll leave a review for the host. As a host, you'll leave a review for the guest. And then on the same day, those reviews are, are revealed. Um, it's usually about two weeks post day. And that actually turns out to drive people to want to leave reviews even more. <laughs> because they know a review is coming. And so you, know, you want to make sure that you, know, you had your say uh, too in the review. And it's been really good because it's created like, more transparency in the review system, more honesty in the reviews that are left, which is great. Um, and an even, an even higher review rate. So, uh, so yeah, that's how. Well, if even if we uh, even if we don't get a um, <coughs> even if we don't get a public review, we'll still get um, feedback right. from the uh, from the reviewer. And then we also, um, we do like a quantitative thing as well, like how would you rate this experience on a whole bunch of different axes that makes it easier than instead of typing in like a, I had a wonderful stay, like we can say like on these di different attributes, how good, how good was your stay and how would you rate it overall? So that can still be, even if you're kind of shy and you don't want to write something, you can still um, create some value from your stay and the reputation of that host or of that guest. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, I actually have a comment and a question. Okay. So the first comment is just when you mentioned the attribution effect. Yeah. And I actually experienced it with Carousel. Um, chef. Uh oh. So uh, like, um, I saw this guy, uh, and I tell him, and then he tried to haggle with me. So I said, no, I'm not haggling. We agree on the price. And then I left him a video regarding this haggle, and then he left me back with uh, my account is stayed right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, so just a comment to share with Carousel. You could maybe try a simultaneous reveal. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Should take note of that. <laughs> yeah, but that was like six months ago, so I'm not sure why. I like see. Who? Yeah, we'll take note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank, luckily, we have this session. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Yeah. yeah, so um, the other question I have is regarding security. Yep. So, like, uh, just yesterday, I was at uh, talk regarding security and yeah, talking about security standards, and recently in the US. I think it was in February, they gave like a, a certain security standards for all um, companies that connect to the internet of things. Yep. So I'm just curious what Airbnb takes in order to guard against this threat and how real is it? And how would you advise um, new startups to take security seriously because like, it's, it's not a priority when it comes to um, being successful? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like, we're, we're at a stage now, you know, pretty. <coughs> You know, I mean, you know, I, I still think of us as a startup or a pretty, you know, or a pretty advanced startup where, um, you know, we have an entire security program. We have, you know, an entire staff that supports that, that crosses engineering and IT and like all these different areas because, you know, we're at that point of company where we've reached, you know, a level of notoriety where there's a lot of bad guys who would love to come in and defraud us, right? Or come in and sort of access our user data. I think in general, you should just like, the way you should think about security, I think, is 
Um, it should always be an evaluation of like risk versus moving fast. And that, that calculation changes as you progress as a company, right? Like if you're really early as a company, you know, you probably want to take on a little bit more risk because you can kind of overdo it on, on the security side and it slows you down so much that your ID doesn't get off the ground in the first place and then who cares if you're secure, right? So I think you have to always be thinking about like, what is the spectrum of you know, risk tolerance versus moving fast? And then just you know, do your best to, to intuit that you're picking the right point along the way. I think you know, the, the one thing I would say to think about early in your security program is just uh, being able to detect if something bad is happening. Like one of, the, one of the big flaws in a security program is that people worry a lot about like perimeter defense and like making sure that a hacker can't get through the perimeter. And you know, the reality is that a determined enough hacker can always get through your perimeter. Like you just have to assume that if like somebody really targets you, they're gonna find an exploit they can get in. The important thing at that moment is if your perimeter is uh, you know, compromised for some reason, like you can detect it and you can tell that somebody's in so that you can respond to it. And that's actually where a lot of people get, get lost. Somebody you know, penetrates the perimeter, they get in, they get access to something, they build a back door, nobody knows about it, and then two months later they use it to really like exploit your user data. So yeah, those are a few thoughts. Okay. So is there a certain metric you use or is there like uh, when you realize that people are attacking you then you realize, oh, I should start building my defenses? <laughs> <laughs> Ideally, you start building your fences before people are attacking you. Um, uh, the way that we do it is we look across. Um, it's hard with security because there's no like one metric that you look at that's like, are you secure or not? Like the secure score. So we just look across like a whole bunch of different attributes of what we do in terms of our ability to like isolate and protect data, intrusion detection, intrusion response. Um, we run sort of what we call like red teams, like teams that'll come in and attempt to hack us and then we see what they do. So we're constantly sort of benchmarking where we stand against our standards and then we have a quantitative scoring system that we use for that to get to a grade on how we're doing. But it's actually like the grade is really a summary of a whole bunch of different attributes that we look at uh, for, for security. But you know, as a startup, like, you know, just, just always again be thinking about the trade-off between risk and moving fast. Like in, a, in an early startup, you need to be moving really fast. Like don't do anything cavalier with user data, certainly. Um, but, you know, I would bias a little bit more towards moving fast in the early days. Thank you. So we're running a bit short on time, so we'll take two more last questions and then we'll finish up with one more question. Oh, okay, great. Well, you pick. Oh, yeah, okay. one from this side. I'm from China. So I have a question about this. So you see FBB and like maybe Google, they can quickly uh, be adopted in China users. But while some of the biggest uh, China internet companies their technology is very hard to get adopted by the maybe Western countries. Like right. WeChat is very popular in China, but by the rest of the world is not so well known for this. Right. So what do you think is the reason for this uh, China's technology company go out of uh, to to the rest of the world? So uh, th let me just reframe the question and make sure I heard it right. It's the question is why are the really successful Chinese technology companies not expanding outside of China? Yeah, cannot be success in the Western country. But Western company, they can be get success in China. Well, I, I would maybe challenge the second part of that statement in that there have not been very many Western companies that are successful in China. Um, I think one of the only examples I can think of is Apple has been successful in, in China, but not a lot of the other technology companies and have been. Maybe it's successful. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. We aspire to a lot more in China. It's a it's it's an incredibly exciting market, but you know the I guess maybe the 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 thought that I have on that is that you know there are these incredible businesses in China that are like as big as these global Western businesses that only need to be in China to be that successful, right? Like you've got you know a company like Xiaomi or Alibaba or Tencent. I mean they have so many potential users just in China and so much opportunity just in China that they probably have to make a strategic decision about do we just capture more of the market here in China where there's you know billion people that we can go after or 
do we exert a bunch of energy on the harder problem of attempting to get um, outside of the country and like penetrate into other markets? And I think it's only a matter of time before that becomes the strategic priority for a lot of these these companies. And I think they're they're already thinking about it, thinking about it through partnerships and stuff. But but that is a strategic question I'd be asking myself because like building up a really powerful company in China, you actually don't have to go outside of China right now because there are so many potential users and so many more people coming online every day. So that's just one that's just one thought of like. You know, if I were, you know, running Tencent, which I'm very much not, um, that's something I might be thinking about. Yeah. Last One question, more. maybe from there, that side, um, Winston. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard any women ask a question yet. Yeah. So uh, my name is Winston. Uh, yeah, do, do you have a question? <laughs> Engineering related. I'll give you uh, one, one more question for you. Go ahead. Uh, so I want to ask about, uh, there are a lot of good programming languages coming out days uh, and frameworks. And I know that Airbnb was built in like Yeah. Uh, has it like impacted you guys? And how do you, you know, like uh, keep up with such new technology and like take the technology in your like, business? How does it impact on both? Oh, like how do we think about adoption of new technologies? Yeah. Um, we try to be. Uh, pretty disciplined about it these days. Like, it's very easy to get excited and sort of swept up by the new technology that's really fun and cool and hot at that moment. But then you sort of get down that path a little ways, and you realize that like the tooling and the frameworks and everything else hasn't really been sorted out. And then suddenly you have a new technology stack that you have to support, and that your operations team hates and whatever else. Um, so we try to be really disciplined about it. We've decided that um, Ruby on Rails is fine for like our presentation layer and our API layer, that's just fine for us. It, wor it works okay. It's not the most scalable, it's not like the fastest, it's not the most memory efficient, it's okay. We can get some more machines to handle that stuff. Um, for like the services layer behind the, scene, behind the scenes, we decided to standardize on JVM languages, so we use Java and Scala. Um, and the reason that we, it was actually like you know three years ago when I came in. There was a lot of exploration for different um, technology stacks. Like some people were writing things in languages like Go, which are, is super cool. Um, but uh, but we decided to standardize a little bit more because what we wanted to do was build a like kind of scaffolding around a, a technology stack, such that each time you build something new with that technology stack, it gets a little bit easier. You don't have to like reinvent things over and over again. And at this point, our ability to develop in JVM and the services layer is actually pretty robust. And so when you start a new JVM service at Airbnb or a new Java service or whatever, um, you already you get things built in like the containerization, how you're gonna do monitoring, how you're gonna do logging, like all the things that the operations people know how to do. So I think there's some advantage to standardizing on a technology stack. And if you decide to adopt a new technology, it should be a really like big decision for you about like, I really am not able to accomplish my goals with whatever technology stack I'm using, so therefore I have to use this new thing. Not just that seems cool, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go use it. So, uh, you know, that's my that's my opinion on that. Cool. One more question. Um, kind of two in one, actually. Oh, so, two in um, one. One is uh, what are your challenges finding uh, quality technical talent, and mm. also um, I guess asking on behalf of more people here, how to get a job at Airbnb. Mm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, you know, finding finding technical talent. Um, I think that, like, what? So, we're in a very fortunate position where there are a lot of people who want to work in engineering at Airbnb. It's very flattering. I feel great about it, and I don't take it for granted. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the challenge that we have honestly is finding like a diverse group of people that want to work in technology uh, in general. And when I say diverse, I'm talking about things like uh, gender, racial background. I'm also talking about diversity of what kind of job you had before. Um, it's actually extremely hard to uh, find the kind of people that you want to bring into a team to end up with the team that you want to design, right? And for us, that is like a huge focus in recruiting because we're lucky. We've got this opportunity where a lot of people want to work at Airbnb so we can be selective about, about who comes in and then we really focus on trying to like create the team that we want to have at the end of the day. And we believe that if we create a highly diverse team of people, diversity in thought as well as diversity in, in who they are, that we will be a better company. Like that we'll actually be able to better represent the community out there. I know that's probably not what you were asking. It is. But that's but that's like something that we 
um, that we really spend a lot of time on, and I think it's one of our biggest challenges that we have in how we do technical hiring in general at, at Airbnb. So that's probably like my overall answer on that one. How do you get a job at Airbnb? Um, I think, uh, first of all, you apply. <laughs> <laughs> Step one, apply. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, when you get that, uh, when you get that, that call back and somebody wants to talk to you, um, you know, make sure that you prepare. I think that the people who do great in our interview processes are the ones who take it really seriously, who do a bunch of legwork and preparation in advance and come in very well prepared for the technical interviews and for how they're going to talk about, um, you know, how they think about Airbnb's place in the world. And those are the folks uh, that do really well, who really take it seriously and prepare. And I will tell you that when I was interviewing at Airbnb, I prepared a lot, and that um, it really shines through in the interviews. And we get we get some people who come through, you know, who uh, you know are coming out of a well-known company or something, and have interviews at like, you know, five different companies at the same time, and they don't prepare a lot for Airbnb because it's not that important to them. They don't do well in the interview process. So it seems like kind of an obvious answer, like prepare for an interview, but that um, but you, it really shows the people who do and the people who don't. Um, but I encourage you to apply. <laughs> We'd love to work with you. <laughs> cool. I think we have one. Manmi has a question, right? Yeah, last question. Yeah, so oh, we got one more. All right. Yeah. Okay. Last, last. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, another reason that, you know, I and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people is after the new design changes, mm -hmm. maybe around two years ago, uh, the, you know, a lot of my friends tried Airbnb after the new logo came in. Yep. So, how well do you see the integration of design and engineering working together? to actually build an awesome product like Airbnb and being a design powerhouse. Yeah, I actually think um, I think that the way we work with design at Airbnb is a huge strategic asset for the company because in a lot of places design is not considered like a first order participant in the discussion and it really is at Airbnb which is so, so powerful, I think. Um, we have an incredible design team and they put so much passion behind them, what they do. How we actually operationalize it, right, is that for any major area that we're working on like uh, you know, I'll think of an area that I talked about earlier, like conversion. Remember I was talking about conversion, like driving growth and everything. Um, you know, when you look at the leadership team of the people that are working on conversion and are working on hitting their goals, a great leadership team in our engineering uh, product group contains a product manager, product management lead, an engineering lead, a design lead, and a data science lead. And if we have those four groups working together, then we have the right counterbalance of sort of incentives and personalities and everything else to form a great leadership team that can actually lead to an awesome product um, uh, down the line. And what, what we find is that we, when we have a great leadership team of people who have spent a lot of time working together, most of the time, they're not even really playing that functional role of like, I'm a designer right now or I'm an eng lead right now. They're being strategic, working together, figuring out and solving problems. And then they go off when they're done solving problems and go you know, do their functional roles. But really, they kind of get to step out of their functional role and just think about how do we hit the goal. Yeah, so it's, it's cool. I love working with designer at Airbnb. Um, with that, we want to please give a big thank you to Mark. Thank you for having me. If I wasn't doing this? What? Wait, what? If you, if you have two best engineers, engineers in the world, what project will we start? Oh, interesting question. And I assume it can't be I just start Airbnb again, right? <laughs> I, I will tell you something that I find, a space that I find really interesting is, um, is like urban efficiency and automation. Like, I actually think there's a huge amount. Like, if you look at sort of the industry trend of, uh, the cost and like ubiquity of sensor technology, uh, like the, the cost dropping and the ubiquity of sensor technology like rising all the time. And then the cost and ability to process big data in real time also dropping. 
like these two things like sort of converge and you can think that if you're able to monitor and keep track of more things in an urban environment there's so many efficiencies that you could find in that if you knew how things were happening and that could lead to sort of like a more sustainable life uh, for people in urban areas so that's that's something that I think is really cool so if you have a really smart team of engineers you know maybe you should think about that <laughs> cool yeah thanks everyone all right that's great